This morning, I want to talk to you about being a great leader by serving those under you. You see, that's what Jesus did. He was probably the greatest example of a leader. He led by example, but his example was that he cared more about the individuals that were around him than he did even himself, and he would humble himself. Jesus didn't have any kind of pride. He didn't lord it over them, and yet he had all the power in the whole universe being the son of the living God. So we're going to talk about the leadership, and we're going to talk about being a servant. Leaders need to be servants. And um, before I even start, I found a, a video clip. I did put it up on Facebook. But this video clip is by a, um, a, a, a speaker who gives a great definition of what a good leader should be all about. I don't necessarily agree on every single item he said. You might not either. But he's got some very, very important points especially if you one day want to be a leader. Now, you say, well, I'm, I'm just going to end up working for my job the rest of my life. But, you know, we are all leaders. You might be the leader of your family. If you're, um, if you're a, a husband, you're the leader of the home. If you're a wife, you're also the leader of the home, and you're a leader over the children. So you need to learn the concepts of what good leadership are in the Bible and not necessarily get it from the world. So let's spin this video right now. And uh, it's only a, a short clip and see what you can get out of it. And then we'll go back and we'll read scriptures about Jesus teaching his disciples and what leadership was all about. All right. Let's spin that. Bring the lights down also to uh, the grandmaster. OK. Charlie Kim, who's the CEO of a company called Next Jump in New York City, a tech company. He makes the point that if you had hard times in your family, would you ever consider laying off one of your children? We would never do it. Then why do we consider laying off people inside our organization? Charlie implemented a policy of lifetime employment. If you get a job at Next Jump, you cannot get fired for performance issues. In fact, if you have issues, they will coach you and they will give you support just like we would with one of our children who happens to come home with a C from school. It's the complete opposite. This is the reason so many people have such a visceral hatred, this sort of anger at some of these banking CEOs with their disproportionate salaries and bonus structures. It's not the numbers. It's that they have violated the very definition of leadership. They have violated this deep-seated social contract. We know that they allowed their people to be sacrificed so that they could protect their own interests. Or worse, they sacrificed their people to protect their own interests. This is what so offends us, not the numbers. Would anybody be offended if we gave a $150 million bonus to Gandhi? How about a $250 million bonus to Mother Teresa? Do we have an issue with that? None at all. None at all. Great leaders would never sacrifice the people to save the numbers. They would sooner sacrifice the numbers to save the people. Bob Chapman, who runs a large manufacturing company in the Midwest called Barry Waymiller, in 2008 was hit very hard by the recession, and they lost 30% of their orders overnight. Now, in a large manufacturing company, this is a, this is a big deal and they could no longer afford their, la their labor pool. They needed to save $10 million. So, like so many companies today, the board got together and discussed layoffs. And Bob refused. You see, Bob doesn't believe in head counts. Bob believes in heart counts. And it's much more difficult to simply reduce the heart count. And so they came up with a furlough program. Every employee from secretary to CEO was required to take four weeks of unpaid vacation. They could take it any time they wanted, and they did not have to take it consecutively. But it was how Bob announced the program that mattered so much. He said, it's better that we should all suffer a little than any of us should have to suffer a lot. And morale went up. They saved $20 million. And most importantly, as would be expected, when the people feel safe and protected by the leadership in the organization, the natural reaction is to trust and cooperate. And quite spontaneously, nobody expected, people started trading with each other. Those who could afford it more would trade with those who could afford it less. People would take five weeks so that somebody else only had to take three. Leadership is a choice. 
It is not a rank. I know many people at the senior most levels of organizations who are absolutely not leaders. They are authorities, and we do what they say because they have authority over us. But we would not follow them. And I know many people who are at the bottoms of organizations who have no authority, and they are absolutely leaders. And this is because they have chosen to look after the person to the left of them, and they have chosen to look after the person to the right of them. This is what a leader is. I heard a story of some Marines who were out in theater, and as is the Marine custom, the officer ate last, and he let his men eat first. And when they were done, there was no food left for him. And when they went back out in the field, his men brought him some of their food so that he may eat. Because that's what happens. We call them leaders because they go first. We call them leaders because they take the risk before anybody else does. We call them leaders because they will choose to sacrifice so that their people may be safe and protected, and so his, their people may gain. And when we do, the natural response is that our people will sacrifice for us. They will give us their blood and sweat and tears to see that their leader's vision comes to life. And when we ask them, "Why would you do that? Why would you give your blood and sweat and tears for that person?" they all say the same thing: because they would have done it for me. And isn't that the organization we would all like to work in? Thank you very much. Thank you. Powerful video, huh? When I saw the video, I was reminded of. A situation that Jesus had with his disciples, and we'd like to get right into the scriptures and read about it right now. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. We're going to read verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And verse 37, they said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and one other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the bapti uh, baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard this, the other ten disciples, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. And of course, it's because jealousy always rises up when somebody else is getting either the promotion or something like that. It's a normal human instinct. And we have to kind of like suppress these things. We can be happy when other people are promoted. But Jesus called them to himself and he said, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, and Gentiles are individuals who didn't know God, the pagans, they lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, you shall be their surgeon, or, uh, surgeon servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see any parallels in that motivational speaker when he was speaking? I mean, we'd agree, gee, that would be a nice thing. But you know, the concept is Jesus Christ. The concept comes from the Word of God. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He was willing to go ahead and lose his life so that he might see us gain eternal life. John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 17, uh, 12 to 17. This is after communion, according to uh, John's Gospel. They have this great time. And Jesus is talking about the new covenant. And they're all excited about the messianic kingdom. They're all, you know, and they're saying, hey, you know, we are, we are the apostles. We're the generals. 
So then Jesus ends up taking a towel, takes his outer clothes off, and he starts to wash their feet. And in verse 12, taking his garments, he sat down and uh, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. I, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, this is a concept, a law of the Spirit, that when we prefer others more than ourselves and highly esteem others more than ourselves, good will come to us and blessings will come to us because this is the pattern that Jesus taught us. I am appalled at what's happened in the business world. I majored in accounting and uh, business uh, from Hofstra University. So I'm very well versed in the whole business mindset. And accounting is the language of business. So therefore, we understand what makes profits and losses. We understand it's accountings, accountants are the ones who become financial officers, okay? They're the one, why? Because they're the ones who kind of like know the inner workings on, on how the money flows and how it, how it operates and how to make a profit. To see where we have come in America today when it comes to the exploitation of employees in companies is appalling. Tell you a short story, but it was very it's it's very apropos for what we're talking about here. My father, he was a World War II veteran. He got out of um, um, the service and he uh, because my my uh, uncle was a radiologist in Brooklyn and uh, he uh, got him a job working with General Electric in X-ray. It's the only job my father ever had after um, he got out of the service. He worked there until they forced him into retirement because his salary was too high. He was one of three installation specialists of medical systems in the United States of America. He had the whole East Coast under him. He was proud of his work. He never missed a day of work. He was never late to work. He would never allow anyone to speak ill of General Electric. This was his life. But he used to refer us to when that company was a fledgling company in the 40s after the war, it became the most powerhouse when it came to installing x-ray machines all over the United States of America. They're the ones who basically had every hospital in the 50s and early 60s until Japan came in with a competitive um, spirit. My father was offered, there was a headhunter, and uh, he had gotten hold of one of the executives of GE, and he convinced them to go with them at a double the salary and a tremendous more commission. So they wanted my father because he was one of the most outstanding uh, representatives of GE. All the doctors and hospitals used to be owned by all the doctors back in the 50s and 60s before they went corporate. So that it was more of an intimate group. The doctors loved my father because my father was an, a man with integrity and he had honor. And they used to say when the salesman from GE came in, they would say, because uh, the salesmen are always selling to new, the upgraded version. So they'd say, well, listen, we're going to talk to Joe first. That's my father's name. And then we'll let you know whether we want to buy it. And my father would say, you don't need this new stuff. They're just trying to sell you new stuff. He said, the old stuff is good enough. you still got about five to ten years left on it. You know, it hasn't given you any trouble, has it? No. I said, they're just trying to sell you the new version of it. So these salesmen that would come in, who really didn't care too much. They, didn't, they were an old school salesman who cared about the company. They were very young. They were in their 20s, and they just wanted to make sales. So they'd go back and complain to the corporate office and say, you know, Joe is stopping us from selling stuff. You see, my father wasn't in sales. He was in service. And there's a difference. 
So they would complain all the way to Milwaukee, where the headquarters used to be. And uh, they go right up the ladder to the VPs. It just so happens that some of the VPs that were still there, and they were all getting older like my father. He was in his early 60s at the time. They, they would kind of like talk to the officers down here and say, look, Joe's been here a long time, man. He's like part of the woodwork. Yeah, you know, he, he's old school. If, you know, and, but, you know, like the man's been here so much longer than all of you people. You know, like just give him a break. I'll talk to him. And they would call my father and I'd hear the conversations on the phone. And my father says, they don't care about this company no more. They don't even care about the people. In fact, the guy that's over me, my father used to say, the new guy you sent, you know, he's only 30 years old. And this guy, I know he's only using it as a promotion to get somewhere else into another company maybe. And they would talk back and forth. It goes, yeah, it's not the same anymore. We understand that. They don't care about the people anymore. You see, it used to be when you worked for GE, you had a job for life. And that was it. They took really good care of you. So my father was high salaried. And of course, his knees were given out because he used to, you know, he used to have to do all the, he was a serviceman. So at 60 years old, he had trouble climbing ladders, but he still did it. And uh, he had a staff underneath him, but, you know, my father was a hands-on guy. He would show all of his workers under him how to do things. And he had a whole division under him, architects and designers, and my father was the, the key man to be able to set up the whole room. To make a long story short, my, they forced my father into retirement. They couldn't fire him because it would have been a big stain. And not only that, corporate in Milwaukee said, you can't do that to Joe. You've got to understand, the man, this is his whole life. He's given his whole life to the company. We can't do that. So they forced him into retirement. You know how they did it? They gave him the same salary. But what they did was they reduced his job down to changing light bulbs sending him on jobs to hospitals. When he got there, the equipment wasn't there, and he'd have to go back to the office, drive back and forth. They pressured him. The local people down here pressured him until the place, he got to the place where he just said, you know what, I've had it. And I remember going to the, re the retirement party, and what a joke. Go to the, it was at the Miller's Inn. The, our whole family went there. My father, I think, was only 60 63 years old at the time, but he'd had it. And we went there, and two of the corporate guys from uh, Milwaukee flew in. Big wigs came in. You could see that there was a difference between their mindset and the mindset of the other people that were locally here, the sales manager of the office and the, and the youngest serviceman that took my father's place. And they're all congratulating him. But you know what? In my spirit, I could see, you know what? There is a division here. There used to be an American society where people did care about people. I know we had problems with, with entrepreneurs, and I know the history of the United States of America and the Industrial Revolution and how some of the super wealthy bankers and some of the industrialists, uh, Carnegie Steel and all, how they treated their workers and unions. I know that. But if you think it was bad then, today, instead of hiring mercenaries to come and basically beat you up or even kill you and shoot you, and that's what happened to some of these union fights. Now what they do is they manipulate by lying. They manipulate by basically making it so difficult for you to work there. Jesus said, this is not what a great leader is all about. And if you want to be a great leader in the kingdom of God, then you can forget about all of the glory as far as and the pride that comes with the position. You can forget about all of these things. You can forget about the first parking place. You can forget about all of the just the, the, cheap, the, the nicest hotels that you're going to stay in in the ministry. I remember when I went to Haiti, we got to Haiti the first time, and I went there because we had somebody in our church who was, um, uh, she was a registered nurse, and her husband, uh, they both, uh, he worked for Pan Am before Pan Am went out. They had a recuperation center in the poorest of the poor areas of Haiti. When I got to Haiti, I went to the airport. I could not believe 
how the airport was set up. They had television cameras all around the place, and it was welcoming missionaries. That's all. Nobody visits Haiti on, for tourism. Missionaries go there. I could not believe it. And there's people trying to go ahead and come up to you and hand you brochures to stay at their hotel in Port-au-Prince. So I said to Peggy, I said, we're not staying. She goes, yeah, that, that's for the missionaries. He says, yeah, that's something. And she was so humble, she said, I don't even get into that. I said, where are we going? She goes, we're going where there are no hotels. In fact, there's no buildings. In fact, we got tents. We got pump tents. They got floors in them to keep the tarantulas at. He said, but, he said, that in the neighborhood there where we're going with the poorest of the poor, they know we're coming because there's a recuperation center there. She used to take, in Haiti at the time, they used to, they were so poor in the back hills of Haiti, they could not feed all the children, so they'd be starving. So they had to make a decision. So any new babies, what they did was they just put them out into the field and them starve to death. Now, the mothers were upset over it, but there's nothing they could do about it. There was no food to feed them. They were all. Typhoid was down there, the big wreck X, uh, X things on the, the building. You can't believe it. It's only, it's only about 90 miles away from the United States of America. But the vision doesn't go there because they have no natural resource. They got nothing that we want. So therefore, you got millions of people that are just there. It's like a penal colony. It's like, that's what it was like. But they gave us, they, they dug a hole so we had an outhouse. And they were really proud. It was the only structure in the whole place. And it was so proud of it. They had an outhouse. There was no bowl, but it was an outhouse at least. And we got water out of a reed that came out from one of the mountainsides and, and went into um, a five-gallon bucket. And they had to put chlorine in it to be able to kill the germs. And nobody liked how much chlorine they put it in, so we had to put, um, we had to put Kool-Aid stuff in there. And that's what we drank. No air conditioning, no nothing, or whatever like that. You see, there are two sides of being a leader. And there's two sides in being ministry. You can be in the ministry and end up having such a large ministry that there's so much money coming in that you have to build such a big staff to be able to keep everything going. you got to keep the machine going. That's what happens in the corporate world. And Jesus is saying, don't be like the corporate world. I always wonder why Jesus didn't start a massive, massive church. His whole career for three and a half years, he's got 12 disciples. He's got other people following, but he's got, he's got 12 disciples, and he went alone with them and taught them. Now, of course, he had people coming. Yeah, but pastor, it's in there that he had crowds, but even Jesus himself. These people are not here because of me. They're here because of the bread and the fishes. He fed 5,000, but how many of them were there in his hour of need when he was in his place of destitution and humanly in his, in his passion, they deserted him, including his own disciples. They were afraid for their life. But what message did he leave 24 hours before? The idea that they should wash each other's feet. Interesting thing, I looked up in the International Bible Standard Encyclopedia for a good definition of the custom of washing feet. And this is what I found. It was looked upon as the lowliest of all services. And Jesus pointedly contrasts Simon's neglect of even giving him water for his feet with the woman washing his feet with tears and wiping them with her hair. Remember in Luke 7, verse 44? And of course, Judas is going, hey, you know what? She just broke that vial. That thing was expensive. We could have given that money to the poor. And the encyclopedia goes on and says, On the last evening of his life, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. That's in John's Gospel, chapter 13. Their pride, heightened by the anticipations of place in the messianic kingdom, whose crisis they immediately expected, prevented their doing this service for each other. See, our pride has a tendency to, to have us to have a, what I call tunnel vision, where we only see what we want to see and we only see what's going to help us in our pursuit of happiness 
Possibly the same pride, it goes on, had expressed itself on the same evening in a controversy about places at table. And Jesus, conscious of his div divine dignity and against Peter's protest, performed for them this lowliest service. His act of humility actually cleansed their hearts of selfish ambition. It killed their pride and taught them the lesson of love. A few Sundays ago, I spoke on the golden rule and how we need it back in America. And of course, you know, we took it off the schools because the, um, the liberal progressives who were atheists or even Christians thought it was not good to have any religious things ever on the wall again because the kids might be influenced by them. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Oh, things are much better, aren't they, in schools now? Yeah. Back then, I can tell you right now, when prayer was in school, there were no metal detectors in any of the schools, including in Brooklyn, including in the Bronx. There were more people going to church. And not only that, the very school systems advocated individuals, go to your house of worship on the weekend. And as a boy growing up, I remember, I would get up on Sunday morning. I always wanted to be a farmer. I don't know why. I can't stand the smell of farms. But they look really good on TV, and you can't smell anything. So, you know, it's, it's, I always wanted to be, you know, I was watching the morning farmer, you know, and I remember they came out with this great chemical, DDT, and they said, this is going to enhance all of the crops in America. Isn't it wonderful about science? Well, this is back in the early 1950s, and now we know that DDT is a cancer-causing substance that doesn't really degenerate into the ground. It doesn't biodegrade. It sits in all of the ground. We'd have to wait thousands of years for the dirt and the dust to settle down to be able to bury that stuff. But what they did find is the DDT. When the cows ate the hay, the DDT was in the hay. And when we drank the milk or ate the cows, we were getting the DDT in our systems. That's not hype. That's not globe stuff. That's fact. It seems that man is forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of truth. And the truth of the Word of God is this, that the way up is down. The way up is down. I tell this story all the time. I heard it in Bible school. It's so great about promotion. You want promotion in anything. This is the way to get it. In the world, in the business world, any way you can get into the top position you want to get there. And you ever see that movie, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying? I think it was that movie where, you know, it was all cutthroat and they act nice to each other, but in reality, they're setting the person up for failure. We all see these movies and go, yeah, that's terrible, but it goes on all the time. How about in your own life? Can you be happy when somebody else gets the promotion that you don't have? I remember as a young man when I was in Bible school, and uh, one of the people in my band, he was promoted first in the sense that he ended up having this tremendous ministry where he started a church. Healings and miracles are happening. But God sent me to Bible school to sit there and pray for two years and to understand the Word of God in a vertical relationship with him. To top it off, I was invited so many times to leave that position where God wanted me, because that's where I felt he wanted me, and to go and just start working. And I wanted so much to do it. But every morning, I always prayed this prayer. Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll be the servant that will go anywhere that you want me to go. I'll do the thing that nobody else wants to do. What do you want me to do? I want you to stay here and seek my face. You see, a lot of times God tells you what to do, but that's not what you want to do. So therefore, you kind of like look for a confirming word to do something else. Like as a musician, when I first got saved, oh, man, you're a musician. Man, you've man, you got to stay playing music. I don't want to play music anymore. I gave it up for 20 years. I was a professional musician. Never played it for years. So all these places that would invite me to speak, they say, bring your saxophone. Bring, oh, please, just bring it and play it. No. Why? There's a million musicians, but not that many who speak the word of God. And I just want to preach the gospel. And my invitations got smaller 
and smaller. This is when I was first saved. He says, something's wrong with him. Man, you can't hang your harp on the, you know, you can't do that. You see, but I was pursuing God. I was pursuing holiness. I made Jesus my full-time job. What is that like? Is that part-time? In fact, there's some Christians that are so part-time, they're just like you know, a weekend warrior, a couple hours. That's it. They give them once a week. How many Sundays are there? 52? 52 Sundays. And some people only give them 26 Sundays. But how many Sundays can we come and be in the presence of God and then the rest of the week not even have any inkling that God's there? And then we basically are crawling at, by the end of the week, I got to get to church. Why not have church every day? To do that, you've got to get rid of some of the mores and the cultural systems that we inculcate into our brains because of society in which we live in. I mean, how many of you are really an original? Including myself. We're all copies of something. We're either copies of our presence, no, parents. We're copies of uh, people that we, we idolize. It may have never be that we idol. I want to be a rock and roll singer. I want to be just like this one. Or I want to be an actress. I want to be just like that. I just want to be like that. Don't you see that that is a form of like idolatry? And if it's anything less than that, it's just a distraction. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Paul who said, said listen, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't. No, follow me as I follow this pastor or that pastor or that evangelist or this move of God or this wind of doctrine blowing through the church. No, follow me if I'm following Christ. But if I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me. Help me to find him. I want to be one of those where the book of Revelation says these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever they go. These are the ones that are sitting on the right and the left of the Lamb of God. These are the ones that did not count living this life as more important than living the life that God wanted them to live down here. They were willing to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow after Jesus. Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the mark of the high calling Christ Jesus. Even Paul had to go ahead and do that. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just getting boisterous here. I'm speaking to myself, too. I point my finger at you, my thumb's right back at me. I'm no different than any of you. Yeah, but look at you. Look at me. Okay? Don't look at me. Okay? Wait another 25 pounds. I'm on a diet. Okay? And then still don't look at me. Okay? I'm trying to make you laugh a little bit. It's a little serious message here. But I'm speaking from my heart. Well, but God wants spoken, you see. God doesn't care how much how much you do for him as much you as you are becoming in Christ Jesus. Paul said I labor like a woman in childbirth until Christ be formed in you. But I am so glad because I see that the word of God grows and increases. It grows and increases as you read the word of God. As we listen to preachers preaching the Word of God and not just happiness messages all the time. See, happiness messages don't change you. It's like somebody buttering me up and telling me how good I am when I already know what I am. I've lived long enough to know the areas of my life that stink and the areas of my heart and mind that are good Okay, so you're going to try to tell me something that I don't know, especially that God doesn't know? I've been around the block so many times with God about the areas of my heart and my mind that you're not going to tell me nothing I don't know. So everything you say is going to truthfully be fluff. But I like compliments. But I don't live by compliments. Because if you build your life by compliments of other people, beware. Because when people are complimenting you all of the time and saying good things about you, Jesus said... Hey, beware when everybody is speaking wonderful about you. Because it means there's not really any evidence 
of the cross in your life. And the cross cuts across cultures. And we need the cross of Jesus Christ to cut across the culture of American society. I hear sometimes that, that God is saying, these people, when he said it through Jesus, he said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now's the time I should tell a joke, because you're all getting serious on me again. I can't speak but by my spirit. And you don't want me to speak except from my spirit, because you won't be changed. I could fluff you into hell by just saying nice things about you, and you'll never change. It's like a parent who gives his kid every single thing. You know what? They become spoiled. And then when they go into the world, they wonder why the world is not like mommy. Mommy gave me everything. Daddy gave me everything. Well, that's not the world. That's fantasy land. That's Disneyland when you create this with your kids. The best thing you can say to your kids in a loving, gentle way, not screaming, is no. Because what it does is it, this resistance builds up integrity within them to understand that when you want something seriously enough, you will deny yourself for it. I use a diet all the time because I'm on one now. But you know what? People say, you know, are you having trouble on your diet? No. When I'm on my diet, I'm on my diet. And when I'm not on my diet, I just am honest about it. The reason I am fat is because I like to eat. I love to eat. When I go to an Italian restaurant, I'm going to tell you, it's a funny thing. I thought I was Italian. You know. You know, I'm in my 60s now, and I find out I'm not that much Italian. What am I, 14% Italian? I'm 37% I'm Scandinavian, and I'm 27% Asian. The reason I pursued this now, you're going to laugh, because I grew up as a musician playing a horn during the Motown era. So I hung around all African Americans. Back then, they wanted to be called black. So I hung around with black people all the time. I live with them. I travel with them. I ate with them. And boy, you want to get a revelation about how there's no such thing as color changing human nature. When I used to travel with the black bands and go to their houses to stay overnight to save some money, I found that their parents, this was when I was really young, their parents were saying the same things that white parents said about their kids. What's wrong with these kids today? Can't they go get a job? You know? And I was amazed. I said, you know, racism is the stupidest thing in the world. That's how dumb society becomes. We basically come back to our primate stage, where we're just living as animals, and we start to go ahead and separate by uh, different species and different tribes and different colors and different groups. Fat people, skinny people, long-haired people, blue eyes, this, that, and the other. That's just a primal thing. That's an animal thing. Paul said they're forever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. That we are all God's children and we all have the potential for salvation. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in it would not perish but have everlasting life. That God did not send the son into the world to judge the whole world. That's black, white, everyone, Asian, yellow. No, but he sent the son into the world to save the world from its sins. That's the message of the gospel. I think Philippians sums it up pretty good here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. I love reading the Word of God. Why? Because the Bible says, Jesus said, my words are spirit in their life. The flesh profits nothing. I could give you a nice fluff sermon. Man, I was an entertainer. I could entertain you to the place where you would leave this place and say, man, that was a great, great message. What did he talk about? I don't know, but I felt good. Why do you think people drink and do drugs? To make them feel good. That's why they do that. Why do I eat? It feels good. Aren't you glad it's legal though if you don't abuse it too much? Oh, I have so many stories to tell, but I'm not going to tell those stories though. I will say this though. 
being on a diet for four weeks last Sunday night. Jess and I, we were alone, kind of. So we, uh, the kids were out. What were they doing, working? I don't know what they were doing. But anyhow, Jess and I, I said, hey, Jess. And she always agrees with me, even though she knows I'm going to be bad. Okay? And good is not bad, and bad is not good. This was not, this was bad. I said, you know what? I might be on a diet, but you know what? Famous Dave's Barbecues, the ribs. They got so many different kinds of spices, more than uh, Colonel Sanders used to put, you know, with all his herbs and spices. I don't know what they put in it, but anyhow, my taste buds were so flat. Okay, they've been eating, it's like my taste buds and my tongue has been in the desert for the last four weeks, eating the bland stuff I've been eating. So all of a sudden, I take a bite of this, this, this rib tip or something. What is it called? Burnt ends? I, I just take one, I put it in my mouth, and my tongue, ex my tongue explodes. It's singing hallelujah. It's like, I'm in food heaven for a moment. It's like, hallelujah. Woo! I look over at Jess, and she's going, oh, wow, man, this really tastes good. <laughs> I'm woofing down, and I picked up a rib, you know, and I, I don't like it when they overcoat the ribs. And the rib, I'm looking at this thing, and I'm going, you know what? They did it right. This cook must like food. He's not doing it as a job. Because this rib was not dried out. I can't stand it eating a dried out rib. You know, you know what kind of dried out rib? It was, you take it and you can use it as a hammer. <laughs> it don't matter. The bone and the meat is the same constituency, okay? No, this thing was juicy. And I eat that thing. Oh, my gosh. But I'm on a diet. So we actually, huh, we shared a meal. And we had enough for another meal and a half. Wow, it was good, though. And now you're all hungry. That's why. So we got to end this message. See that? There you go. Hey, you got me into this. See that? You, you had a way to get me to end this message. But we got to read this scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. I can't leave you on a down note. That's why I kind of like just tell personal testimonies. And I know I'm a little silly at times, but that's my life. You know, I'm happy. I really am. I'm a happy man. I know what it's like to be miserable. I was miserable for a very long time in my life. But I'm still serving God. You still serve God when you're miserable. You should, anyhow. But that's not what God wants. You see, I found that the abundant life that Jesus promised is not riches so much as it is having the satisfaction every day of waking up and saying, thank you, God, for everything in my life, the good times, the bad times, the mountaintops, and the valleys. That is the joy unspeakable and full of glory that Jesus wants to give every one of us. It doesn't mean everything is going to be happy all the time. Okay, Happiness is a state of being for the moment. But what I want is to be able to know I am aligned with God's will because I know if I'm aligned with God's perfect will that he's going to cause it all to work together for good no matter what. If I walk out of his perfect will for a little moment, if every day I'm saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done, guess what? He moves me by the Spirit of God back into. It's like a built-in gyroscope, a built-in turning towards the north all the time. Anybody ever, uh, well, you, you got GPSs now. You don't even care about north anymore. Praise God. They don't even have it on a lot of GPSs. But you can tell where you're at as far as directional if you have a compass, because the compass, magnetic north, is magnetic north. It doesn't change. It's always there. And no matter where you are in the severe of the earth, there's deviations that take place, but you can just program it in, 3D, uh, three degree deviate, and, and you, boom, you're right on target. The incredible thing is that you can not only do it by the magnetic north, you can do it by the stars, and that's how those came across the ocean. In fact, if they didn't have a storm, People could leave Europe, and they would go travel south because they wanted the trade winds, and they would go over, and they would just follow the trade winds, and they could land within a half a mile of where they were the last time, all by the sun and the stars. Why? It's because they're fixed. They're absolute, not in this land of relative moral value thinking where, you know, uh, good is bad, bad is good, and whatever is good today, it, could, it doesn't have to be good tomorrow. Whatever we want it to be, that's it. When man becomes God, he becomes like a little child in, an, in, the, in, the, in kindergarten where they play. And they just make these fantasies, you know, like, okay, I'm going to be a bear today. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a lizard today. Okay, and, then they're, and they, then they're crawling around in the ground, and then they ask the teacher, what are you going to be? I'm going to be the teacher. Ah, you're no fun. I'm the teacher. 
Can't you change it? No, I am the teacher. But your kids, you can do these things. Now we got full grown-ups trying to change them themselves into different species and different things. And you know what happens? With a reprobate mind, you cannot judge right and wrong. Right and wrong has to have some kind of a standard and a compass and a, and a north where you can point to so that you know if it's right or wrong. Jesus was pointing them to the best way, even if he didn't have a compass. But he, he best said this, the way up is down. By the Spirit, Paul writes this, Philippians, I want to finish. Let us, in verse 3, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8, let us, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? Lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than yourself. What a, what a way to live and be blessed. You want to be blessed tremendously? Never have a need? Give. I'm not talking about offerings here. I'm talking about give of your life, your time, your material substance. Bless others. And watch how it'll be given to you. Why? It's a law. It is a spiritual law. Give it, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give to your bosom. And, of course, preachers in America are always using it to be able to get the budgets bigger so that they can afford everything. And sometimes that's true because the people don't give. But the fact is that's not what the Scripture was all about in the first place. The point was give of your life. Stop living for yourself. Stop being the center of the earth. And, stop see, and see yourself as an individual who will be blessed as you take care of the needs of others. God will take care of you. That's what that video was all about. Just look for needs and fill them. Just don't come into church and then leave church and not care about the one that told you the story about having a tough time. But do something. We all have to do that more. I've got to do it more. But at least I'm trying to do it. You say, well, I don't have enough money to do it. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have enough money. It's like parents will say, you know what, I'll spend more time with my kids when I finally get the time. And then all of a sudden the, the song, the cat's in the cradle in the silver spoon, little boy blue, the man in the moon, I don't know the rest of the song right now, but you know what it is. Church, you know what it is. Okay, let verse 4, let each one of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Gee, that's a, that's a, that's a revelation to some people. Wow, I didn't know I had to look out for interests of other people. Which other people? Just my family members? He didn't say that. It doesn't say just your family members and everybody else can go you know where. Okay? The heck with everybody else. No, he didn't say that. Let each of you not only look for your own interests. That means that you've got to go ahead and develop this thing in your head that every time you see somebody, you should be saying to yourself, Lord Jesus, is there something that I could do to help them and bless them some way? It might not be money. It could be time. Do you know how many lonely people there are in the world? There are people lonely in the church right now. All of us have spent a time probably lonely. It is, to me, that's the worst. You know, some people, it's not having money. Not to me. I'm happy with eating a jelly donut or just eating a piece of bread and butter. I don't really care, okay? If there's any kind of food, I can eat it, except a lot of green vegetables. But if I was starving to death, I'd eat them. But then I'm eating to live rather than living to eat, which is something I deal with now. But you're laughing. Let's finish this up. Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of what? No reputation. We got people trying to protect their reputations. Someone said to me, aren't you concerned about your reputation? What? I don't have a reputation. I really don't. Live long enough and... I can guarantee you can find dirt on anybody, okay? That's what the media loves to do. Why? Because we're all sinners. We've all got a track record of sin somewhere, and a journalist somewhere, if he wants to take you down because he don't like your message, he'll get to your character. Why? Because there are no one that's righteous. Even Jesus, who had no sin, they lied about him. So forget about your reputation. What's more important is how God looks at you. 
Personal integrity is much more important than outside reputation because that can change in a moment. But if you do this thing about being the servant of all and caring about other people, watch and see what happens. Being found, verse 8. Well, he took on the form of a, a, a bondservant, verse 7. And in the, coming in the likeness of men, he being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross, on the cross. That's pretty powerful. The way up is down. It really is. You want to be promoted? Don't butter the person above you, but help him succeed above you. I guarantee you, most people will not forget you. To me, the most important quality that you can ever find in a person is loyalty. That's just me. And what is loyalty? Through thick and thin, you stay by them. You make a covenant with someone, I'm your friend. That means that if he screws up, you're not going to desert him. But you're also not going to tolerate his sin. You're going to get alone and say, look, you screwed up, but we're friends. I'll help you out of this. But you've got to change, and I'll help you change. You see? That's what true friends do. That's what loyalty is all about. That's what Jonathan had with David. That's loyalty. And guess what? That's Jesus. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So if you feel forsaken, it's not the Lord who's forsook you. He's always there. we got to close right now. I'm going to ask you to stand at your feet. I hope you got some things out of this message. A lot of it was what I got from the Scriptures. A lot of it was the Spirit of God just speaking to our hearts. But the one thing I do know, something's got to change in America. But trying to change America is like trying to steer a tanker by yourself. You know these giant tankers? You know it takes 21 miles to stop the thing, let alone make a turn? So when they hit the brakes, they don't hit the brakes. They put it in reverse. They literally have to stop the engine. They have to change the gear because these big tank tankers only got, tankers got one gear. It's forward, and then you got to, you actually literally got to shut it down, turn these, turn the gears so that you can get it into a reverse. So forget about reverse. It takes a long time. 20 miles to stop a tanker. And you're going to stand there and stop America yourself? You say, well, how do you do it? Well, you do it one canoe at a time. You change direction. You change in your way. So how do you do this? Practical application and we'll pray. Today, think about what I said about, you know what? I'm not going to just look out for myself today. I'm going to try to bless somebody else. It might be somebody who you know you should have called back. Somebody, you know, you haven't, you know, they're a pain in the neck. Everybody's got a pain in the neck. Don't rush your hand, okay? Because they might think it's the person next to you. But everybody's got a pain in the neck, okay? I was just going to say, but I'm not going to say, pastors have a lot of pain in the necks because I don't have any pain in the necks in the church. Nobody's a pain. Everyone is a blessing to me. Really. Everyone's a blessing. Why? Because they make me pursue Jesus even more. Now, you can take that any way you want to, but the point is that I have learned the way up is down. I learned that you are all God's children, and as a shepherd, I have to care for every one of you, no matter what you're going through or no matter how you're difficult to deal with. The point is that Jesus loves you, and if I love Jesus, I don't, shouldn't have a comment. I'm a servant. If Jesus says, help this person, I'm not going to say, but Lord, I don't like that person because they're not of my crowd, okay? I don't, Lord, you want me to go ahead and talk to, to African Americans? I'm white. They don't like me. And then African Americans are saying, I'm not going to talk to that white guy because they don't like me. Well, how do you know? Treat everybody as an individual and find out what they're really like personally, and then you can go ahead and make a determination like Dr. Martin Luther King said, not on the color of their skin, but the content of their character. That's what will bring the nation together. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray right now. Father, we just pray, oh God, that you would take, Lord God, what we share today, make it root in our lives, how to be a great leader by serving those under you, whether we're parents, whether we're working on a job. We're going to treat those that are under us not as if we are their lords over them. And they're only, they're only doing what we say to do because we could fire them. But, Lord God, we want people to respect us because they know that we have their best interests at heart, not only our own interests, Lord, as the Bible says, and, Lord, then we will be promoted, and people will take notice, Father God, and we will never do without 
We thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen.